Hello, and welcome to the seventh episode of the Christian History mini lecture series. Today, we are going to study a period of history spanning from 730 to 1054 AD, uh, that is right up until the Great Schism between the Eastern and Western churches. We have a few objectives for today. Firstly, you'll be able to explain the reasoning behind the veneration of icons, which is still a controversial issue to this day within the church. Secondly, you'll be able to explain how the establishment of Christian empire both aided the development of Christian theology and posed problems for the church. And finally, you'll be able to explain the controversies which culminated in the Great Schism. I'd like to start uh, to draw your attention toward this map, which I showed you guys in a previous lecture, and you will see how in just a few generations, a religious movement that was started by Muhammad became an empire. And you would see that Islamic caliphates would have control over much of what used to be Byzantine territory. Uh, North Africa, um, you'll see historically Christian cities like Jerusalem, Damascus, Antioch, and Alexandria all swallowed up in the Islamic flood. Um, the Visigothic kingdom in Spain, much of the Middle East, all of this, uh, it's change it switched over from Byzantine control to Islamic control. Now, for the first time, we will have Christians who are born and raised in an Islamic nation. And while it is definitely true that during this time period, there was a fair bit of persecution against Christians within uh, Islamic territories, um, you know, they had to pay an extra tax. Uh, any Muslims who converted to Christianity, in some situations, they were even executed. However, Christians uh, were allowed to live, generally speaking, um, without too much trouble, so long as they weren't trying to go out and proselytize Muslims, uh, much like it is today, actually, in many parts of the Middle East. Um, so we had Christians who grew up within an Islamic world, um, who were not part of the majority culture, and they produced some really interesting ideas and works. One person uh, who's a great example of this is John of Damascus, and I'll talk about his role in the controversy about icons. In the 8th and 9th centuries, a huge debate, especially in the Eastern Church, was over the use of icons. Icons being images that could be used in worship, maybe images that are, you know, decorating the inner sanctuary of a church, or even, you know, is it all right for Christians to look towards an image when they pray to God? Is that not a violation of the second of the Ten Commandments, you shall not make for yourself a graven image. Um, so we had conflict between two groups of people, uh, some of which we'll call the iconoduals. These are people who were okay with the use of icons in worship and the iconoclasts who were not okay with it. Um, a huge proponent of icons and one of the most important theologians of the seventh and eighth centuries uh, was John of Damascus. John of Damascus grew up, uh, he lived under Islamic rule. According to some historians, he even served under Islamic rulers in some sort of political capacity. Uh, John of Damascus was a great theologian, a monk, an apologist, and a philosopher. Uh, while he lived under Islamic rule, he gained quite a bit of knowledge about Islam, their basic tenets, uh, the Quran. And as a matter of fact, in his writings, John would write against Islam. He would speak often about the problems with the Islamic religion and the Quran. We don't have time to get into that right now. Now, John of Damascus is most famous for his defense of the use of icons. Now, John of Damascus had an argument that has deeply impacted the Catholic Church, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church, even some pockets of uh, Protestantism. John of Damascus argued this. He argued that Christ, at the incarnation, the Son became human. He took on flesh. And therefore, because of the fact that Christ took on flesh, that Christ was visible, that God revealed himself to us uh, physically, that therefore there is some grounds for us to look at or to compose an image of Christ and to use that as a reminder of what Christ has done for me. And that when I venerate an icon of Christ, I'm not worshiping the icon, at least I'm not, you know, 
adoring the icon in a way that I'm actually should be adoring God. I am adoring God through the icon. Kind of like if I had an image of my wife that I kept in my wallet. Okay. I'm not cheating on my wife with the picture of her in my wallet. I am honoring her through showing her affection through, you know, there, there's an affection I feel for her through the image. Um, and this has a huge impact on the way that people think about icons. Um, we have the Second Council of Nicaea in 787 AD. Um, and at the Second Council of Nicaea, they decide that the use of icons and images in worship is okay. Um, it's okay so long as we remember that these are things that remind us of the deeper realities which they very beautifully uh, communicate to us and that therefore we should feel free to actually venerate the icons themselves. Um, these icons should aid in our worship of God and not distract from it. Um, and more than this, the Second Council of Nicaea affirms John of Damascus' assertion really that the world which God has created is an icon, you know, like when we say that the heavens declare the glory of God, right? Are we not saying that God has imaged himself analogically through creation? Why can we not believe or affirm the fact that through these images that holy of holy people, of Christ, of saints, that God can bestow us a kind of special grace through them? Um, this is an excerpt from the decision at the Second Council of Nicaea. These honorable and venerable images, as has been said, we honor and salute and reverently venerate, so that through their representations, we may be able to be led back in memory and recollection to the prototype and have a share in the holiness of some one of them. Now, if you are a Protestant, uh, you are probably listening to this and getting kind of freaked out. Like, oh my goodness, uh, what is Mr. Choi saying? Isn't this a form of idolatry? But even within Protestant circles, this debate still rages on. Think, for instance, of the recent uh, TV series called The Chosen. I've noticed in Protestant circles that a lot of people are divided on that. Like, should we watch a video of Christ? Is that itself, you know, making a graven image in an idolatrous way? Is this helpful? Does it distract from worship or does it supplement it? Similarly, you know, I mean, if you go to some Christians' homes, they might have an image of Christ hanging on their wall, whereas others would not be comfortable with that. Um, so this issue is one that's going to pop up again during the Protestant Reformation, um, which we will get to uh, many lectures from now. The next person I'd like to talk about is a man by the name of Charlemagne, one of the most famous, most influential, and most important people uh, who lived during the early Middle Ages. Charlemagne was, as I've mentioned in a previous video lecture, the grandson of Charles Martel, the ruler of the Frankish kingdom who defeated the Umayyad Caliphate in the Battle of Tours. Now, Charlemagne, unlike his grandfather, took on the title King of the Franks. Charles Martel was functionally King of the Franks. He was basically the greatest ruler. However, he didn't actually take on the title of King. There was a puppet King in place instead. Now Charlemagne becomes actual King um, and he doesn't stop with the Frankish kingdom. He invades and takes control of the Lombard kingdom to the east of him and finally becomes known as Imperator et Augustus, uh, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, Charlemagne, after gaining control of the Frankish kingdom, uh, engaged in some exploits to the north. There were a group of northern uh, Germanic tribes that descended into Charlemagne's kingdom and started raiding villages. Think the Vikings, okay? The Saxons are very, very closely related to the Vikings. Now, Charlemagne, after hearing news of these invasions, decides to retaliate. So he musters his army, marches them north, and defeats the Saxon armies easily. Um, after he's conquered the Saxons, he, like most kings, is ready to put them to death. However, he was willing to spare Saxons who would convert to Christianity and be baptized. So this is a kind of forced conversion. However, it's important to note that Charlemagne was likely trying to demonstrate leniency and also an ambition to see pagans convert to Christianity. 
Um, Charlemagne also destroys the Irminsul, which was a sacred shrine that symbolized uh, the tree of life. So the ancient Viking uh, culture, some of them would refer to it as Yggdrasil, uh, the great tree that uh, held together the universe. Now, Charlemagne moves to the east and conquers the Lombards in Italy, um, basically doubling the size of his kingdom. He also engages in conquest to the south. As we've spoken about before, there's a huge threat of Islamic invasion from the south. Spain is under Islamic control. Charlemagne moves his armies down south uh, to push back uh, any threats from uh, Muslim forces. They sign treaties. They make truces. Now, on Charlemagne's way down to Al-Andalus, uh, to what is now Spain, he engaged in some battles with some of the Basque people, and they were not very pleased about this. So on Charlemagne's way back up northwards, uh, he was ambushed by a large army of the Basque at the Pass of Ronceval. Now, this battle is really important. It's a tragedy. Charlemagne's rear guard is basically ambushed in this pass, uh, and they are slaughtered down to the last man. Uh, one man who was among the group was a man by the name of Roland, one of Charlemagne's important officers. And this story uh, is basically immortalized in the legendary Song of Roland, a really, really interesting and artful and poetic poem about this battle. Now, in this battle, we have a much mythologized Charlemagne. Uh, Charlemagne is 200 years old. He's got white hair. He's this prophet king who is fighting for uh, the protection of Christianity, which is, I suppose, partially true. Now, uh, Roland, who is one of Charlemagne's holy knights, uh, fights to the death. Uh, before warning Charlemagne of the uh, encroaching Islamic force that's getting them. You'll notice that it's an Islamic force rather than the Basque. So that's changed uh, when you get to the Song of Roland. Um, and Charlemagne uh, is portrayed as this heroic figure. Now, that communicates to you something about how Charlemagne was viewed, especially by the Frankish people, but not just by them, by all of Western Europe. Charlemagne was a Christian emperor who came into power, united a bunch of defenseless Christian kingdoms under one banner, and was zealous about defending Christianity. Um, Charlemagne is most famously remembered for rescuing Pope Leo III, uh, who had gotten into some hot water due to some political conflict. Pope Leo III, who was facing, you know, uh, potential exile and uh, destruction, he reaches out to Charlemagne and asks Charlemagne to defend him from his political opponents. Uh, and in return, Charlemagne would be crowned Holy Roman Emperor, which is a title that Charlemagne accepts. Now, Charlemagne helps provide a level of stability and peace to Western Europe that enables Western Christian thought and culture to flourish in a way that it never had. And we'll refer to this movement as the Carolingian Renaissance. Uh, Charlemagne was not well-educated. He did not receive a wonderful classical education uh, like someone like Augustine or Origen might have received. Charlemagne's education was very practical. It was military education, political education. Charlemagne uh, was not super literate. I know that some of his biographers like Einhard really try to talk up Charlemagne's intelligence. He wasn't a very bookish person. He's not a scholar. However, as after Charlemagne comes into power, he becomes deeply interested in Christianity and much more devout, and he desires more of a theological education. So Charlemagne begins pursuing his own education. He even hires Alcuin, one of the most brilliant Christian theologians of his era, to come and to be his personal tutor. Um, Charlemagne, according to historians, would have uh, scribes read to him Augustine, uh, you know, Augustine's Confessions and City of God, uh, while Charlemagne was eating. You know, he, he was deeply interested in uh, the Christian tradition. Now, this creates a need for Christian scholarship. And Something that Charlemagne's involved in is planting and opening monasteries all throughout his kingdom. Uh, we discussed earlier how even after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, uh, monasteries like Benedictine monasteries rose up and they became the educational institutions of the early Middle Ages. I mean, you know, uh, men would go to monasteries um, often in pursuit of God to flee their enemies for refuge, um, but they would 
learn how to read and write. They learned to memorize scripture. They would copy down scripture, but not just scripture. They would copy down great ancient uh, texts, ancient Roman texts, uh, Latin texts, even pagan texts, and in so doing, preserved classical culture for the future. So the Carolingian Renaissance helps really bolster the monastic movement. We see huge advances in theology, philosophy, literature, and art, including music. Now, Charlemagne was not the only person who had to deal with the invasions from pagans to the north uh, we had the Viking attack on Lindisfarne in 793 AD, which is one of the most important events of the very end of the 8th century, because it is the spark uh, that starts the explosion, which is the conflict between the Viking invaders and the British. Now, Lindisfarne is a monastery in Britain, uh, not super well defended, obviously. Uh, now, a group of Vikings, these mysterious outsiders, land on Lindisfarne. They come, they're well armed, they attack the monastery, they ravage it, they burn it, they steal the relics, and they slaughter the people. Now, this event is a shock to British Christians who were unaware of these people to the northeast of them and to the Vikings. Uh, they get really excited about this because they learn there is a ton of land to the southwest of us that we did not know about. It is warmer. It is fertile. It's easy to take things from them. Uh, and pretty soon after the attack on Lindisfarne, we have a whole volley of invasions um, of Vikings on British soil. Now, it got to a point where the Vikings became an existential threat to British Christianity. Um, Christian British settlements were being uh, swamped and swallowed up by Viking invaders. Uh, Britain at the time was divided into several kingdoms and they were not united under a single banner uh, until Alfred came along. Alfred the Great is one of the greatest kings of England. Uh, he was king of the West Saxons. He wasn't supposed to be. His brother was king, but his brother tragically dies in battle. And Alfred is left king uh, instead of him. So Alfred, after he ascends to the throne, uh, helps fight against the Viking invaders and pushes them back. He eventually becomes king of the Anglo-Saxons, de facto king. Now, Alfred the Great beat back the Great Heathen Army. The Great Heathen Army was a huge Viking army that was comprised of various uh, Viking tribes here in common purpose to take Britain uh, and to colonize it, basically. Now, Alfred the Great, despite the fact that he was severely disadvantaged, his military was often not uh, as powerful or as large as that of the invaders. He was still able to defeat them using some military ingenuity, although he went through some really difficult times. Alfred had very poor health. Uh, there were times when he had to go into hiding, into exile, uh, but eventually he defeats the great heathen army and the leader of the great heathen army, Guthrum, uh, offers to be baptized into the Christian faith in exchange for his life. Alfred the Great is a very devout Christian, and he is super excited about the prospect of being able to baptize and convert one of the pagan leaders. So he does just that. He uh, baptizes Guthrum. He makes Guthrum into basically his spiritual son. Alfred becomes his spiritual father. Um, you know, it's just really interesting. Now, the Vikings who were living in Britain had to agree to a number of conditions as a consequence of their defeat. So the land that they occupied, we refer to it as the Dane law. More specifically, that's the government of the Vikings. And the Dane law, uh, there were legal restrictions that were placed on them. Uh, they were obviously not allowed to go out and to attack more British settlements. Uh, they had to submit to certain legal principles, which is also a big deal. We see the Christian civilization uh, taking control over the Viking civilization in Britain. Now, Alfred the Great is also remembered for encouraging English liberal arts education. Um, this is a big deal. Learning higher education uh, and higher theological uh, ideas and thought, these tended to be written down or they tended to occur in Latin. Latin was the higher language. Uh, English was a common language. It was a common tongue. Now, Alfred the Great was a firm believer in the English language. He believed that the English language could become a higher language that we could engage in higher theological, philosophical uh, discourse in. As a matter of fact, Alfred the Great translated Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy into Old English. 
Now it's going to take uh, hundreds of years before English is really taken seriously as a literary language, but Alfred's translation of Boethius into English continues to be studied even to this day, uh, especially if you're a classics major, you might come across it, you might even have to translate it. Um, it stood the test of time. Now, We've talked about the benefits of Charlemagne and Alfred. Charlemagne and Alfred are two examples of Christian leaders who rose up, defended Christian civilization against uh, the invasion of pagan forces. Uh, these are men who established Christian governments and Christian laws, and they united a bunch of scattered Christian kingdoms uh, under a single banner. That was a big deal. They also provided uh, a level of stability and security that allowed Christian culture and art and literature to flourish. There are also downsides, however, to this development. Um, as Western Christian civilization becomes more powerful, more affluent, as kings become more and more powerful, uh, as the church gains wealth as well, we have a problem which is growing corruption. Um, we would often have situations in which kings and princes and lords would institute their own bishops, often who are not qualified. Uh, we had situations in which secular authorities would take control over and pressure bishops uh, to do their will. We also had infighting uh, between bishops and a lot of really disgusting political conflicts between popes. Uh, Pictured here is the cadaver trial, uh, the famous cadaver trial, in which uh, Pope Stephen VI, uh, to the left of us, uh, or to the left on the screen here, had his old political opponent, Pope Formosus, dug up and he held a trial in which he accused the cadaver uh, and then he cut off three of its fingers and desecrated the body. Um, so one of the uh, more interesting uh, trials uh, within the church. Now, an answer to the growing corruption in the church came from monasteries within the church. Uh, an example of a monastic reform movement was the Cluniac reforms. Um, a lot of people in the Western church were really deeply grieved by the corruption they saw springing up within the church. Uh, they believed that something needed to be done about it. Uh, the Abbey of Cluny was a really important monastery that was founded. Uh, it was a Benedictine monastery, and the monks in the Benedictine monastery of Cluny uh, prevented intervention of feudal lords and bishops. They were famous for trying to kind of form a community that was independent of outside meddling and outside political strife. Uh, there was a huge focus on basically returning to the rule of St. Benedict. They were concerned by what they considered to be corruption, even within Benedictine monasteries, that a lot of monasteries had lost their way and had become uh, too hedonistic. They had forgotten their mission. So instead, at the Abbey of Cluny, they were sort of redoubling their efforts to uh, live lives of purity, of prayer, service. Uh, education flourishes here. Um, now, the Abbey of Cluny is famous for its fight against corruption. Uh, and it was a fight that kind of turned into an entire movement. The Cluniac reforms are people who advocated for the Cluniac reforms uh, forbade clerical marriage. Up until this point, it was very common for priests to have wives and children. Um, while, you know, uh, celibacy was kind of an ideal, um, if you were a priest, you could totally get married, um, but there was a problem, and the problem was this. We had a lot of kings and lords who would depose priests or bishops and get someone, a yes man, someone who would do their bidding, you know, maybe one of their political servants. They might make them into the bishop or priest of a city, and that was not great because of the fact that we had a lot of people who rose up uh, into church office who were not qualified, uh, who did not know the Christian faith very well. Um, we had people who would try to become bishop in order to gain power, or they were willing to become bishop because they were getting paid. Well, if you have to be celibate and you can never get married, uh, well, it's, it's harder to convince you to do so. So forbidding clerical marriage, the celibacy of the priesthood, uh, these were things that uh, were meant to help curb some of that corruption. Um, now, 
we refer to this as the investiture controversy. Um, lay investiture is the phenomenon I just described when a ruler, a political ruler, tries to take a person and to ordain him as priest or bishop. Um, and there's a huge conflict during this time because the advocates of the Cluniac reform says, no, political rulers cannot have or exercise that power over the church. Remember Augustine's city of God, right? The city of man does not have the authority over the city of God to tell it what to do. Um, that power, it belongs to the church. And if it belongs to the church, it belongs to the Pope. So uh, the Cluniac reforms, they take power away from local leaders and then power goes somewhere. It ends up in the hands of the Pope and that itself is gonna come with a bunch of issues and problems. Now, speaking of the Pope, uh, we discussed earlier how Leo the Great's assertion that the Western uh, Pope, the Bishop of Rome, uh, how his assertion that the Bishop of Rome has control over and authority over other bishops, that did not go over so well with the Eastern churches. Um, and that conflict will escalate into what we'll refer to as the Great Schism, the Great Division of the Church uh, into Catholic and Orthodox. Um, now, the East-West split is a consequence of growing tensions between Western and Eastern churches, and these tensions had been growing for basically 700 years. Um, there was a power struggle between the Pope in the West and Eastern patriarchs who did not accept that he was in authority over them. Uh, so a lot of really uh, tense situations uh, between Eastern and Western church leaders. There were also huge cultural differences. Uh, during this time period, during the early Middle Ages, the Eastern and Western churches become more and more and more divided and isolated from each other. They speak different languages. The Eastern church speaks Greek, uh, whereas the Western church, they spoke Latin. Um, so it was difficult to communicate and there was less travel between Eastern and Western churches at this time. Um, there were also huge theological differences that were beginning to emerge. Here's an example. Uh, they tend to view salvation a little bit differently, the Eastern or Western churches. While the Eastern church tends to view salvation as a process by which we are healed, and the Western church, of course, would admit to that, you know, the Eastern church, they tend to reject some of the ideas that Augustine of Hippo brought to the table. Augustine asserted, uh, that we have something called original sin, that we have, you know, from the very moment of our conception, we've inherited the sinful nature of Adam, um, and that therefore we are guilty from the very get-go. The Eastern Church, they don't really accept that uh, view. Um, the Western Church focuses very much on the idea of merit and demerit. We have broken a law, right? And because we've broken a law, there is a penalty uh, that has to land on us. But Christ came in and he, through his merit, pays a penalty. That's very Western Christian language. Whereas it's the, in the Eastern church, they tend to view sin as really more of a defect and a, uh, you know, a, 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 an illness, a disability uh, that the gospel comes in and heals. The Eastern church tends to be a little bit more mystical than the Western church. Um, that's a big deal, but even that was not the main cause of the great schism. Um, the biggest theological difference between the Eastern and Western churches was the filioque controversy. Um, and it becomes sort of the central theological point and really the justification behind uh, the great schism. Uh, the filioque controversy was concerned with a single question. Does the Holy Spirit proceed from both the Father and the Son, or only from the Father? Now, the earlier Nicene Creed did not assert that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, uh, but eventually it got to the point where the Western Church, they really wanted to assert, well, when we look at the book of John, it seems like when Christ says that he will send the Holy Spirit to his disciples, that the Holy Spirit, it, he proceeds both from Father and the Son, whereas the Eastern Church uh, denied that, and there are a number of interesting theological reasons why they did that. Um, this becomes kind of the sticking point. Um, and eventually the uh, Pope and the Bishop of Constantinople are going to both excommunicate each other. The Eastern and Western church will excommunicate each other and the church is broken in half. This was really a lamentable issue, but despite all of the theological issues on the table, including um, 
you know, uh, whether or not we put leaven in our bread. Do we uh, take communion with unleavened bread or with regular bread? That was also an issue. Um, these theological issues were not the real reason for the Great Schism. Um, the real reason for the Great Schism is, as I've mentioned before, the growing political conflict between the Pope and the Eastern patriarchs. The Western Roman Pope wanted to assert his authority over the Eastern Church in a way that the Eastern Church was not uh, comfortable with, and that really results in the split between these uh, two halves of Christianity. A lot of Christians were really, really grieved over this. Like, how can it be that Christ's body is cut in half? Like, we are supposed to be one. How can we be split like this? And over the course of the next couple centuries, uh, both sides, uh, well, really, especially the, the Western side, uh, Christians will try to uh, remedy this split. They'll try to get back together. They'll try to um, reunify the church, but to no avail. Um, and the church has been split into East and West, even to this day. Um, in our next lecture, we are going to talk a little bit about some uh, more of the intricacies between the relationship between East and West. We'll talk about the Crusades, uh, which was also an effort uh, on the part of the West to reunify Christianity, an effort that fails and an effort that results in a ton of bloodshed. But we'll talk more about that later. All right, that's all I've got for you all today. Uh, hope to see you in the next video lesson.